not only related to the law that God has given, but also to the life that an individual has. It's possible for someone who is devoid of rituals to be more righteous than someone who is wholly devoted to rituals. But in turn, an individual devoted to rituals can be more responsible in God's sight than those who are not devoted to them. So the Gentile who has no rituals and is far and right with God, even if he's not involved in rituals, he has a better standing with God than him who has all of these rituals, but his heart is not right with God. Verses 26 and 27. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, his uncircumcision can be counted as circumcision. A man who is physically uncircumcised but who fulfills the law will judge you uh, who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. The argument that Paul is, is uh, using here is that if a religious person disobeys the clear teachings of God's Word, in effect, he nullifies the very uh, divinely given ritual that he's involved in. So if he's disobedient to all of God's Word, God tells us not to steal, but he's involved in circumcision, he thinks, well, circumcision will, will count for something. It will, it will overcome my sin. And Paul is saying, no, it won't. You must keep all of the law and the circumcision on top of it. Now, on the other hand, an individual who's never received divinely given rituals being the Gentile, namely the Gentile, but as far as right with God, enjoying all that the ritual is intended for. He will enjoy all that the ritual is intended for. All these rituals were intended for is to show our obedience to God, our love for God. And if our heart is not right with God, how can we show obedience even through a ritual? Paul's not saying that a ritual that God set up is without value. He is saying that the value is limited by the condition of the person's heart before God. Nothing is or nothing should be mechanical, automatic, or superficial in an individual's relationship with God. And a ritual or ceremony will not make up for the deficiencies in a believer's life. A ceremony or a ritual does not make a person a Christian. And I want to talk a little bit about that here for a moment. A ceremony or a ritual does not make you a Christian. You come to me and you say, Paul, I want to be baptized. We've talked about infant baptism already. Let's talk about baptism. We don't consider baptism a ritual, but it can become a ritual if we think that that's what saves. If you come to me and you say, Paul, I want to be baptized. My first question to you is going to be, have you been born again? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You say, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I just want to be baptized. I want to be saved. You cannot be saved through baptism. And back to the, uh, the thief on the cross. Think about the thief on the cross for a moment. Jesus never told him, you're going to have to come off that cross and be baptized. Let's stop everything. Time out. And you're going to come off the cross and be baptized. And then, then you can be with me. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. So please hear me carefully, especially in this part of the country. You have to be very careful with what, how we see baptism. Is simply obedience to God. You come to me and you say, Paul, I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord. He is my King. He is my Master. I've repented of my sin. I've turned away from my sin. I've turned to Jesus Christ. I want to be baptized. Jesus said, repent and be baptized. So that is your first duty of obedience to God. And I said, okay, let's be baptized. And so the baptism just represents what Christ already did in your life. You're going to come up here in the water, and I'm going to dunk you down, and you're going to go down into that watery grave, and, and you're going to, it's going to symbolize your old nature. You're going to go down, and you're going to come up a new creature. Now, that's already happened in your life before baptism. You're already a new creature. It's just a symbol. Let's go to the Lord's Supper or communion table. Some people think that we can take communion, and that will save us. If we do communion every week, then maybe people will come closer to Christ. It does not work like that. Communion is a symbol. It is a symbol of what Christ did. Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. And as you do it in remembrance of me, you remember Jesus' death. The bread represents the pain and the agony in His body that He took on for you and me. Of course, the juice represents the blood that He shed for us. And there are different denominations, there are different religions that would say that this turns into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible does not teach that. It is a symbol of what Jesus Christ did in our lives. Please understand that. If we can turn 
these ordinances, something God has directed us to do into rituals. We never want to turn them into rituals. They will not, will not, cannot save you. Now, verses 28 and 29 speak to the limitless value of reality. Let's read these verses, 28 and 29. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Please hear this. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. And true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter. His praise is, is not uh, from men, but from God. Now this was no new idea from Paul. Paul didn't come up with some kind of a new form of religion. The Old Testament clearly taught this circumcision of the heart in the law of the prophets. Isaiah talks about being circumcised in the heart. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, Circumcise your hearts. Therefore, do not be stiff-necked any longer. Many of us are far too content to try and keep the letter of the law and ignore its deeper spiritual implications. God always looks on the heart. Here Paul indicts the Jew on the second count, that of putting his trust in a ritual rather than in the reality of a true and a right relationship with God. Now Paul has set himself up for a storm of protest, a storm of criticism from Jews who have placed their faith in their religious heritage and they have placed their faith in their religious rituals. Paul will now address how shallow and how superficial his critics' arguments are. And Paul dealt with the Jews constantly. Everywhere he went, even if he was not in a Jewish town, the Jews came after him and they were furious with him because of his teaching here. They believed that because of their heritage, because of their rituals, that they were in better standing with God. Of course, Paul is pointing out that be not the truth. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 8 reveal the religious arguments raised by the Jews. And these arguments are an attempt to confuse the issue. They want to confuse the issue here. Men and women do not mind discussions of religion. But when it opens up a searchlight on their own soul, they become very uncomfortable. And that's what's going on here. The Jews, the searchlight is now on them. Paul has placed it first on the pagans and the, he, uh, the heathens. And now, and then he placed it on those who were hypocrites. Now it's been placed on the Jew, and the Jew is not happy. 